study with Dr. Brian Schutte down on campus and he specifically is looking at weeds. Uh, this project was a, it was a cover crop project. He had a number of different cover crops and then he planted chili into it and then he's going to evaluate it later this season. He's evaluating the chili response to different cover crops. And so weeds are also considered pests mm -hmm. um, and I don't know all the names of them. I just know if it's not chili, I pull it <laughs> out. Uh, but grasses, some grasses are, are, um, are can be harmful by uh, robbing nutrients in water. Um, there's Palmer's amaranth, I know that one. And, um, but this, this field's pretty clean, mostly because it's a weed scientist and he's after the weeds. He wants to know what they are and how to get rid of them. So, and with the weeds, is that uh, a concern with the leaf hopper? Um, with some of them, I, I do believe that uh, um, Kosha and London Rocket like to harbor the beet leaf hopper in certain times of the year. You have a number of um, early season concerns with insects like thrips, uh, flea beetles, um, flea hoppers, cutworms, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, post bloom, you, you have some concerns with tortoise beetle. Uh, aphids, uh, fall army worm is one, and um, pepper weevil. Uh, another insect of concern because it spreads a virus is the beet leaf hopper, and that spreads the curly top virus. And we're kind of lucky this year. I don't see a whole lot of curly. Here's some curly top over here. Basically, the uh, the um, uh, beet leaf hopper injects the virus into the plant, and then it just stops growing. And it's real when you touch it on the top like this it's real stiff that's one of the telltale signs for the last uh, 13 years I've been working on chili here at the Los Lunas Ag Science Center we've only sprayed specifically for insect pet pests once and that was for tortoise beetle but for the most part what a lot of chili growers are concerned with is the pathogenic fungi and as you can see in the fields here, we're, we're irrigating every other row. The reason for that is there's an old, old saying among chili farmers that chili does not like to have wet feet. And so because, that, because of that saying stems from um, the susceptibility to pathogenic fungi, there's Phytophthora and then there's Rhizoctonia. Now by irrigating every other row, you're mitigating if there's a severe uh, thunderstorm event and it floods your field, well you, you only watered half your field prior to that instead of the whole thing, so that mitigates that to some degree. And if you look at where the water is soaking into the ground, this irrigation will be considered done when that soaking gets beyond these stems. And there's another reason why we do that is because there's a lot of salts in New Mexico soils. Once this irrigation is done and then the water settles in, you'll see that the salt will settle beyond the plant. It'll be over here, so it won't affect the plant oh. as much. So that's another reason why we do that. So, um, it, with the fungi, is it mostly, a, is it affecting like the leaves or the pepper? The whole plant. The whole plant. And the, and the two um, signs that you can tell which one's which is Phytophthora generally um, affects a row at a time because a lot of the spores will settle in at the top of the field where, where the irrigation is if, if it's not properly dried down. If you irrigate that and there's spores in that puddle before you irrigate, that'll spread the spores oh. uh, down a row. Okay. Rhizoctonia is more 
you know, a spot over, you'll see a spot over here, a spot over there, a spot over there. It, it's, there's no row pattern with Rhizoctonia, and that's one of the ways you can tell the difference. Usually Rhizoctonia uh, affects chili earlier in the season, but we've seen it affect it later in the season too. But uh, oh, one, thing, one thing I'm noticing is a lot of bees going from flower to flower. Um, this is all one variety, so seed saved from this patch here will probably be pure. It'll be um, Sandia, New Mex Sandia chili. We do have another field where we are trying to keep pollinators out. Um, chili is self-pollinating and insect pollinating, and, and there's different degrees of cross-pollination that can occur within chili peppers that sometimes it just depends on variety sometimes it depends on the year uh, but uh, this would be cons if you were to keep seed from this field this would be considered open pollinated and then we have a field where we have some closed pollination going what about what kind of rotation like do you, a crop rotation would you do with well generally here at, at the station our fields follow either a fallow field or if we're lucky in alfalfa field because alfalfa um, is a legume and um, fixes nitrogen unfortunately one drawback to that is is chili is susceptible to alfalfa mosaic virus oh. which is in alfalfa so you'll see that more if you are plant have a field planted next to alfalfa we've seen that um, it affects it if it affects the growth but i gotta say it's a makes the leaves look kind of pretty and then there's a tobacco um to, tomato spotted wilt virus um which i haven't seen any this year but we're gonna start someone's coming up to look for it next week wow. so here's these these plants that are caged in terms of chili and pollination, if you want to keep your seed pure, you exclude pollinators out of the plants you want to keep for seed. So we have, I have a number of different varieties I wanted to save seed from, and I put down a tomato cage and then this insect netting. And that keeps insects going from flower on one variety to the other and crossing them. So these are gonna, this is going to be pure seed later. And with chili, again, uh, depending on variety, um, some cross-pollinate more readily than others. Um, there was a study done in at New Mexico State where some of the hot, hotter varieties cross-pollinated easy, uh, more easily than others. And um, some of the bell peppers didn't cross as much. A lot of these are heirloom chilies, and then there's some some heirlooms from here in New Mexico and then there's some heirlooms from other parts of the world um, and these were kind of the rarer ones that I picked out of my seed stash that I kind of wanted to just make more seed and um, I guess I'll put in a little plug uh, I, I if anyone wants seed I just give it to them um, I, I, I'm a firm believer in that you know, the more people that have it, the less of a chance that a variety will go extinct. And I think that's important. And then over here, I have a number of different tomato varieties. And you'll notice, in terms of pollination, none of these tomatoes are, are caged. Tomatoes are, don't cross-pollinate very easily. They do, but it's, it's, it's kind of it's more the exception than the rule as opposed to chili and they're both in the same family the Solanaceae crop but um all you got to do with tomatoes is just pick a ripe one squeeze the juice and seeds out of the fruit into a into a cup fill that cup up with a little more water and what you're doing is when when you initially take tomato seed out uh, there's a gel around the seed soaking it in water 
lets that gel dissipate and then you can put it in um, uh, through a strainer and then dry and collect the seed that way so tomatoes are really easy and then if you cage chili that ends up being easy too you wait till the till the chilies turn red and the reason why is that's when um, the chili pods um, or fruit are are finishing the, the seed in the fruit so so that they'll germinate in the following year so if you were to take seed from a green chili pod or fruit and tried to plant it it wouldn't be fully developed oh. 